Morning, Tuesday the 29th of November finds me in the small but very busy uh, country village of St. Field. Belfast down that way, down Patrick down that way, killing way straight on. Village uh, has been here really from about 1712 when it was sold by uh, the Hamiltons to the prices and major general uh, uh, price he uh, really put the town or put the, put the village together that was back in 1712 the people making up the village were largely uh, Scottish and English settlers the land had previously belonged to Con O'Neill and by trickery and default and unfairness Con O'Neill was deprived of his lands and he, he was accused of disloyalty and uh, lands were taken away from him he was uh, lucky enough to escape with his life The lands were given and sold to English and Scottish settlers, planters if you like, and they were Protestant. Anyway, what am I here for? I'm here to uh, video this church. This is First St. Field Presbyterian Church. This church was built in uh, and opened in 1777, but there was a Presbyterian presence in uh, in the, the Saint Field and probably in and around this uh, this site from the early 1600s. Yeah, at one time uh, this church would have had. Uh, 900 families, which is pretty big. Pretty big. And uh, part the old bike up at the side here. Pretty, I can't get in to let, let you see inside, but that's the way it goes. I've come to to video the uh, the graveyard down the back here. This church back in 1792 onwards was a hub of a United Irishmen because back then the minister was the Reverend Thomas Ledley uh, Birch. I think it's Birch. And he was well into his uh, enlightenment and well into his liberal uh, Presbyterian ideas. And the United Irishmen at that time were, you know, their, their, their proposals w weren't uh, mind blowing as such. They, they wanted um, freedom of religion for all peoples and that included Roman Catholic folks and you know that was quite a noble aspiration and they wanted a reformation of Parliament and they they wanted uh, voting rights for everyone which yeah in today's world what they were asking for uh, what they were actually demanding you know wasn't wasn't terrible 
but uh, and, and so Reverend Birch and his uh, his uh, confederates in the uh, United Irish Men, uh, he uh, made uh, Saint Field a, a centre of the United Irish Men in uh, 1792-93. And then, of course, there was a rebellion in 1798, and that came about because uh, the English authorities clamped down on the United Irish men and drove them underground. They became a secret society, and uh, they had to. So uh, then the rebellion broke out, and it broke out somewhere near, well, uh, one of the early battles uh, in the... Uh, United Irish men uprising took place just outside uh, St. Field in, in a wood somewhere, I'm not too sure where. And the uh, United Irish men ambushed uh, loyalist uh, British forces, and that would have been uh, Anglicans as well, would have been involved in there. And uh, they ambushed them, and uh, in the uh, what would have been termed as today a skirmish, a uh, hundred guys lost their lives. But generally speaking, it was the uh, United Irish men who came off best, and they subsequently marched uh, with their heads high to Ballin the Hinch, where they. Uh, English authorities crushed them. So that was the end of the United Irish men. But it, it, a, lot of, a lot of it was uh, based in and around this church. And if, in fact, I'm told that uh, a lot of United Irish men graves can be found towards the bottom of this graveyard. And I'm just taking a wee Jeff Duke around the graveyard and seeing. Uh, what I can come across. Oh, I love this grave here. I love this the the tractor and the. I'm not too sure. Is that a grass cutter? I'm not too sure. William Prentice, his integrity of character, the high standard of all his work, his readiness to serve and help, made him a man greatly beloved and respected by all. Isn't that nice? Erected by his farming and business friends, he ploughed a straight furrow through land and through life. It's not, it's not superb. That's some epitaph. This has to be one of the older ones here. 1797. There's a fascinating structure here. It's like a, a precursor to an old mausoleum, or an old mausoleum. Just trying to get in of it, and round the front. Oh my goodness! And unfortunately, I can't read any of this. It's just I can't see. Oh, is that a date there? Erected. Oh, there's 1780. Don't know if you can see that or not. Oh, that looks like a crest up there. Looks like a lion. There's 1837. Division in Presbyterianism at that time was so great that half the congregation from uh, First St. Field Presbyterian Church, and it wasn't known as First St. Field Ch Presbyterian Church then, it was just St. Field Presbyterian Church. Well, half the congregation decided they didn't want to support the United Irish men in their aspirations. So they up and left, 
and they uh, formed and built uh, a new church, Second St. Field Presbyterian Church, which is opened, uh, I think, about 10 or years later, or 15 or 20 or something or other. Uh, <laughs> Here's, here's an interesting thing. Here is a very interesting thing. The Roman Catholic Church, or the Roman Catholic Congregation in St. Field, and there was one. I'm not too sure whether the church was actually built at that particular time, but um, the Roman Catholic faithful, or the Catholic faithful, if you want to call them that, um, were led by um, Father William Taggart, and Lo and behold, he was a staunch loyalist supporter, a supporter of the crown, and he encouraged his the members of his congregation not to throw their hand in with the United Irishmen, who were actually fighting for for their benefit, but they 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 uh, turned their back on them. And they, they refused to take part in the rebellion. So they didn't turn out for the United Irish men in, in, in St. Field at all. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 1863. I found that, uh, that very, very interesting. Uh, the history of uh, Ulster just isn't cut and dried, folks. Just isn't cut and dried. It isn't straightforward. It's complicated. With people changing sides for various reasons. Quite frequently. Well, this is interesting. Near this spot. Oh! Near this spot was fought the Battle of St. Field on Saturday the 9th of June 1798 between the United Irish men and the Royalist forces. Most of the dead of both sides are interred in, at the rear of this plaque. The two adjoining headstones are those of insurgents who fell that day. So, the United Irish men are, are buried in and around here. And unfortunately well these are the older graves. And you just can't read anything off them. So the battle took place close to where I'm standing. Here lies the body of John Larry of Bally Bally Mar of the parish of Kilinche, died June 7, 19th, 1798, aged 76 years. I wonder did he die in the Battle of St. Field. Here's another one. Here left the remains of James McEven. No. James uh, of Balls Bally Bally McCreeley and so, uh, who departed this life June 1798 aged 48 these must have been two of the guys who, who fought in the Battle of Ballin' a Hinch. Whoa! Whoa wee! Not Ballin' a Hinch, but St. Field. Silly me! The Battle of Ballin' a Hinch followed. Ah, here's, here's, here's a, a, an educational panel. Isn't this great? Autumn 1796, Wolf, Tone and the others garnered support from the French government to send a fleet carrying 15,000 soldiers to Ireland as a stimulus for rebellion. French 
plan to use Ireland as a base for invasion of England. However, due to fierce gears in Bantry Bay, the mission had to be abandoned and the fleet returned. So dear knows what would have happened if they had managed to land. Preparations for the conflict, however, continued through Ireland, out Ireland. And on the 30th of March 1798, the Viceroy of Ireland, Lord Camden, announced that the country was in a state of rebellion and it introduced martial law. The Crown forces were well dispersed throughout the country and were strongly supported by local yeomen and militia regiments. There was no quarter given in the search for rebel weapons or rebels. Uh, there was no quarter. It was a pretty... I've read about uh, these, uh, you know, what the, uh, the Crown forces did to, to uh, people that they caught. There was no quarter. After the arrest of rebel leader Lord Edward Fitzgerald in 1798, armed conflict broke out on the 23rd of May at Leinster, resulting in many bloody encounters, particularly in Wexford. Atrocities were inflicted by both sides. Both sides. Ulster Rising commenced 7th of June with an unsuccessful attack on Antrim Town led by Henry Joy McCracken. Uh, in County Down, the rebels' were, initial success was at Saintfield, were heavily defeated at the battle, and then they were heavily defeated at the Battle of Bald Hedge, effectively causing the collapse of the rebellion in Ulster. The Wexford Rising ended when some 20,000 fencibles and yeomen won the Battle of Battle of Vinegar Hill, dispersing the rebel forces. This is Cragger. The second French invasion fleet arrived a month later and precipitated another rising in Mayo. This force defeated the army of Lieutenant General Lake on the 27th of August but was beaten in the Battle of Ballinamuck. Where's a good name? <laughs> it's of September when General Hubert surrendered to the commander of in chief of the British forces in Ireland. Earl Cornwallis. The final encounter of the rebellion was in a naval battle between France and Britain off Tory Island. The main outcome of the rebellion and the pressure exerted by United Irishmen was the recognition by, uh, by the establishment of the need for political and democratic change. Well, so the rebellion achieved something. A lot of bloodshed, mind you. Uh, they had, and, and, you know, would it have happened anyway over time, you know, these these uh, changes? The Act of Union was introduced on 1st of uh, January 1801, guaranteed the security of Irish Protestants and promising Catholic emancipation, the right of Catholics to sit in Parliament. This promise was eventually fulfilled in the uh, Act of... Uh, and the enactment of the Catholic Emancipation Act 1829 Well, there you go. The First Presbyterian Church St. Field and its uh, historic graveyard. And their connection to the 1798 Irish Rebellion. Really sort of garden down here so how do we how we pick we bird boxes and all up not good the construction of this park was funded blah 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 in memory of the York fencibles yeomen and United Irish men who died at the Battle of St Field June 1798 and somewhere here at, at the these, these, this battle took place. Oh, and we've got more notice boards. More notice boards. My goodness. And this is the, the town this. A wee bit of, is it? No. 1775 to 1798, the historical background to uh, 
the uprising. American War of Independence and the French Revolution sort of, you know, galvanised uh, the movement for, for radical reform in Ireland led by the Society of United Irishmen, which was formed in Belfast in 1791. And this is telling us about uh, this guy, Francis Hutchison. The philosophy of the reformers was greatly influenced by the work of distinguished native of St. Field Francis Hutchison, 1694 to 1746. He became a professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow University. His writings influenced the thinking of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who drafted the American Declaration of Independence. And uh, that's something. Hutchison coined the phrase, the action is best which procures the greatest happiness for the greatest numbers, which became the principal maxim of democratic reformers. Yeah, but uh, the problem is, who decides what kind of action this, this is and, and uh, when it should take place, you know? And who, who's going to decide, you know, what action? procures the greatest happiness for the greatest numbers. That's a sort of a moot point. His revolutionary philosophy, which included the right of resistance against inadequate government, could be said to be brewed in Ireland, bottled in Scotland and on court in America. That's very good, I like that. Francis Hutchison. Well, this is telling you about the uh, Society for United Irishmen. This is great. Co founder and chief architect of the movement was William Drennan, son of Robert, or er, son of Reverend Thomas Drennan, one of uh, Francis Hutchison's closest friends. It was Ruth Tone who gives the society its name. Three resolutions passed, and there they are. I wonder where that document is. And there's Thomas Russell and, and uh, Ruth Tone and St. Field First Presbyterian Church. And Reverend Birch of First St. Field Presbyterian was right in there. Oh, the picture of the United Irishmen. Patriots! Oh, there's a wee river here. I don't even know the name of the river. Silly me. Should know. Could be the lagging, don't know. And this is telling you all about the Battle of St. Field. And that's a grave that I videoed earlier. And there's the in memory of the York Fencibles. And there's the other grave headstone. The stream that divides the burial site locally known as York Island and there's Reverend Birch. Uh, St. Field uh, well known for its radical views. 5,000 rebels gathered on Ockery Hill. Colonel Stapleton was dispatched from Cumber with a force of 270 York fencibles and 30 Newtonards cavalry and 50 infantry against 5,000.
fighting lasted about an hour, resulting in the death of 56 officers and men from the Fencibles and Yeoman. number of rebels killed unknown. May have been greater as the Fencibles deployed their two six pound field guns, having suffered heavy losses. However, the Colonel ordered a retreat. Local lore is that Reverend Birch fought on the rebel side at St. Field, though he later denied this when charged with treason. Well, he would, wouldn't he? Because he would have been hung. He is said to have preached to the rebels at their camp at Creevy Rocks on, on Pike Sunday. It is a reflection of the many family divisions at the time that his brother, Dr. George Birch, remained loyal to the Crown and was a yeomanry officer, while Dr. Birch's two sons fought on the rebel side at St. Field. At his trial, Reverend Birch narrow, narrowly escaped hanging and was forced into exile in America for the rest of his life. The time of the battle, the stream on this site divided and formed a small island. Fancibles and some rebels were buried there and it became known as York Island. The stream has since been diverted and the island now forms part of the town side of the riverbank. Many of the rebels who were killed were carried away by relatives and buried elsewhere. Others who were badly wounded managed to live leaving the battleground but died later. Only two were buried in the marked graves on this site, James McEwen and John Larry. Old history. Old St. Field history. Old St. Field Presbyterian Church, First Presbyterian Church history.